for this year. I'm like, yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was supposed to go to Costa Rica this year oh, in May. Yeah. So that like I can't. That's a bummer. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it's being rescheduled. Hopefully. Yeah. 2021, we're supposed to go. So fingers crossed. Hope, hope so. <laughs> All right, it's 10.30, you ready to go? Sounds great. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our latest Chautauqua lecture series. Today, we have the 2020 Vera Smith Preservation Workshop. My name is Stephanie Sweezy, and I'm the education intern here at Lakeside Chautauqua. In a few moments, I'll introduce our guest speaker, but before I do so, I'd like to say a little bit more about the Vera Smith Historic Preservation Workshop. The workshop is an annual pro program funded by the Memorial Endowment honoring Vero Smith, a lake setter with a love of history and preservation. Each year, usually at the end of July, we have the honor of hosting a preservation professional in a special program to teach us more about preserving the lakeside community. Today, I'm thrilled to honor, to welcome our speaker, Sarah Marsham. Sarah is a well-known professional in the, pre in the historic preservation. She was listed in the top four 40 under 40 people saving places list and is here today to tell us more about preserving recreational communities. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Marsum. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to switch to share my screen as long as the technology cooperates. Um, mm -mm. All right, so, um, hi, I'm Sarah Marsum. I'm a heritage resource consultant based in Columbus, Ohio. And essentially what that means is I strive to make the past physical and intangible relevant to people today for the betterment of our communities and the future. I've spent a lot of time this year um, doing work around the 19th Amendment for suffrage. Um, I kind of specialize in women's and lesser known and represented histories, but I have fun doing a wide variety of work ranging from historic designations to educational workshops. And I'm really happy you are here today. We're gonna talk a bit about social movements. Um, the mid to late 1800s was a huge boom for social movements across America. Uh, specifically, we're going to look at, for the first part of this lecture, the Chautauqua movement, the historic preservation movement, and suffrage. They all emerged at relatively close to around the same period of time. The Chautauqua movement was established in 1874. Historic preservation, 1853 is the date generally attributed to it, and suffrage in 1848. So John Hale Vincent started the Chautauqua movement in New York. Uh, that's easily the most well-known Chautauqua, although I will say that I'm biased and love the Lakeside Chautauqua since I'm an Ohio resident. And the Chautauqua movement really started with tent lectures. It started with finding ways to educate anyone and everyone in ways that they may not necessarily get through formal education because that was not an option for everyone in the mid late 1800s. The historic preservation movement started with Anne Pamela Cunningham found, founding the Mount Vernon Women's Association in the early 1850s. She noticed while on a trip that George Washington's homestead, Mount Vernon, was in terrible condition and was falling apart. And Anne took it upon herself to organize a group of women to lead a movement to save this structure. It was a really comprehensive letter writing campaign, really interesting stuff. Um, and she is the woman and the individual who's attributed to starting the modern or the recent kind of 1800s uh, historic preservation movement. Uh, the national parks, which are tied to the historic preservation movement, and I'll get into that a bit later. Uh, the national parks, the first one founded was Yellowstone in 1872. 
And what makes Yellowstone as an interesting movement as a part of the greater parks environmental social movement um, is that they were initially guarded by militia. Militiamen were, and um, former army work, um, people who were a part of the army, whether it's whole troops or individuals, they were the managers of parks initially. The Women's Convention in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848 was the official rally cry to start the suffrage movement for women's equality. Uh, I don't have any photos of it, obviously, but it's very fun to think of a raucous presentation with women in large hoop skirts. So why were all of these movements emerging? I kind of touched on it a little bit. These movements were emerging for a wide variety of reasons. It was tied to the industrial movement. It was tied to advancing technology, making things a bit easier at home, making it so that people were gaining great wealth. It was tied to trains. Trains were going across the country, expanding people's concept of where they could live, creating opportunities for individuals to live their American dream, to build wealth through farmsteads or other enterprises, maybe even becoming a gold miner if they move all the way out west. Women in the mid to late 1800s started to have opportunities for financial autonomy. They started to be able to work in the labor industry using their skills such as sewing to have income, to contribute to their household, or potentially to be able to take care of themselves as an individual without being reliant on their parents or a husband. Um, education. Our first universities and colleges were emerging across the entire country. Um, the first women's colleges emerged in the 1870s, 1880s. So education really started to emerge in a wide variety of ways. And then, of course, there's the Civil War, which drastically shifted the course of where people lived, how people worked, it impacted the economy in the South. But all of these components combined kind of connected to a collective awakening, a collective understanding that people need to further their education to further understand American history, to further explore America. Um, in all different ways to educate and better themselves. The Chautauqua movement was a wonderful opportunity to allow people who could not afford to go to college or maybe were not allowed to go to college because Chautauquas were open to men and women for continuing education and lecture opportunities. And they brought in wonderful people like Jane Addams of the Whole House. Jane Addams founded the Whole House in Chicago, Illinois, and I highly recommend visiting the next time we're able to travel and be in Chicago. It's a wonderful museum today. But the Whole House was a social enterprise in itself. It helped empower women to be able to take care of themselves, um, to gain skills like cooking that they may not have. It really helped empower immigrants and people newer to the country to have the skills to be able to thrive in America. So she was a very much a forward thinker in the late 1800s. And she's a representative of many of the types of speakers that were brought into the Chautauqua movement, people who were forward thinking and introducing new concepts and ideas. And just the fact that the Chautauqua movement allowed for women speakers and understood that women had expertise is really representative of the larger concepts of of Chautauqua wanting to empower women and men and also amplify these movements that exist. It's really wonderful representation. Other types of speakers, there were a ton of politicians who spoke as a part of Chautauqua movements, um, people who worked for universities and other in educational institutions, but the Chautauqua movement, whether it was a physical institution like in Lakeside or in New York or Bayfield, Wisconsin, or one of the other many other physical Chautauquas, it could also be at one of the tent pop-ups which happened around the country. And after Anne Pamela Cunningham saved Mount Vernon, people all over the country started saving old buildings. Um, I'm not gonna say it was rapid fire, but the historic preservation movement largely picked up steam and places like Thomas Jefferson's homestead on the right, 
that was preserved. Old Salem Museum and Gardens on the left of, was a settlement by Moravians um, who were settlers in the 1700s. That is one of the oldest historic districts in the entire country. It was, was established in the 1930s. So these movements also were able to last over a long period of time, which is remarkable. Um, but we're going to start to see some themes in the types of how they do how they did the work. Um, the national parks, it was largely focused on preserving natural beauty at first. It wasn't necessarily like we think of the environmental movement today. The national parks, like I said, they were managed by people who didn't have any formal training in environmental sciences, which it was the late 1800s, not a big shocker at that. Um, but the idea was that these spaces, and this photo is of Yosemite in California, these spaces were supposed to just be tourist friendly so that anybody could come in and appreciate nature. And while I appreciate that as a sentiment, um, many of these um, military men would actually um, kill um, for lack of a better word, hunt and kill animals, all types of animals and a way to eliminate wolves and bears and other vital elements of our ecological system in order to eliminate any potential or perceived threat to the tourist. So a lot of our ecological systems were thrown majorly out of whack by the initial management of the National Park Service. And there are all um, the types of women who are associated with the suffrage movement. We have Alice Paul on the left sewing the suffrage flag, which was purple, yellow, and white. And a star was added every single time a state um, granted women the right to vote. Um, and then we see on the right one of the famous suffrage parades where they're utilizing Greek democracy and Greek goddesses as imagery to reinforce that women were a part of democracy, whether through folklore or otherwise, since the advent of it. So women who were associated with suffrage largely were middle to upper class women. I highly recommend reading the book Funding Feminism if you're really interested in learning more about the suffrage movement. But these types of women were associated with suffrage because they were women who did not have to necessarily be concerned with finances. So they were able to invest in the social movement and to travel and to invest in things like these large parades and to invest in the sewing of the banners. Um, it's, so we largely associate people like Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, these types of women with the suffrage movement. So who did these movements serve? And who the movement serve is based in things like who you allow to speak. Uh, Benjamin Tillman was a Chautauqua Circuit speaker and politician. He was the governor of South Carolina for a number of years. And then he was a US Senator until his death in 1918. He was a US Senator for over 20 years. He was also a outspoken um, advocate for lynching. He defended the lynching of African Americans. He also opposed civil rights. And a number of his stances we would largely consider to be egregious today. So who you serve gets impacted by who you invite to speak because when you have an individual like this who is advocating for beliefs of hate, you potentially are making it so that many people don't feel welcome to be a part of your movement. And like I said, for suffrage, suffrage was really integrally tied to coercive philanthropy. Because of middle class and um, upper class women largely being the leaders of the movement, it impacted whether or not working class women felt that they could be involved because they did not have the money because these wealthy women who had money, they were dictating the terms of the suffrage movement by and large. Um, a number of the 
benefactors for the suffrage movement specifically wanted to prohibit advocacy for women of color to get the right to vote. A number of the women who established the early women's college, at least two of the early women's colleges explicitly said not to allow women of color to be allowed admittance. The other institutions, while they did not explicitly leave out these individuals, they did not admit these individuals. So we see both passive actions that lead to people feeling like they're not included. And then we see actions that explicitly outline how people cannot or should not be included. And I think there can be benefits to course of philanthropy at the end of the day, using your money for specific benefits, but it can also be used for negative larger implications. And I'm sorry for the quality of these photos. On the left, we have Lewis Mountain Negro area. And on the right, we have a picnic grounds for white only. These were our national parks. I'm not saying all national parks had explicit segregation, but many of the national parks and state parks throughout the entire country explicitly segregated what types of areas could be enjoyed and explored by individuals. And this has been largely ignored when we're thinking about the larger context of our parks, because our parks are advertised as places for the American public, but they weren't always that kind of format. So when we think about how people may not feel welcome to be a part of the Chautauqua movement, maybe because of who the speakers are, or maybe the investment behind the movement makes it so that people who don't have as much wealth feel like they can't have a voice, or maybe that money makes it so that people are intentionally excluded. And then we create these constructs like segregation to exclude people from these larger social movements that are it's, you know, the old saying of a road paid for good intentions. There's always some uh, negativity there. Um, so that's something that we really have to think about as we think about these social movements as a whole, because as we celebrate things like the 19th Amendment this year, which granted women the right to vote, not all women could vote 100 years ago. So let's think about that as we think about the benefits of the social movements, also the negative impacts which have occurred. So when I say people feel excluded, it leads to people creating spaces where they feel comfortable. Dr. James E. Shepard founded the National Religious Training School in Chautauqua for the colored race in 1910. That's in Durham, North Carolina, and that evolved to be North Carolina Central College, which is still open and in operation today as a historically black college and university. So why would a space like that be created if they felt included in the original movement? One could potentially, you know, connect the dots and say that they didn't feel included. So they had to create the space for themselves. And again, like all of these choices, it not may not be explicitly chosen to segregate or to not make people feel included, it may just be because of implicit biases. Biases that these people in the 1800s, 1900s did not realize that they had when they were making those decisions of who could speak and things like that. We also, when we talk about like the history of the historic preservation movement, and I'm a contributor to the third edition of Historic Preservation, it's History, Practices, and Principles, um, I'll admit I had no clue who Adina De Zavala was until a couple years ago, and I left her out of that textbook. Adina De Zavala, she started doing work to preserve the Alamo in the late 1800s. It's because of Adina De Zavala that we have the Alamo in Texas. Adina De Zavala started doing historic markers in the late 1800s through the 1900s. Historic markers like we see today on the side of the road to commemorate history of all types. Adina De Zavala is a founder of the historic preservation movement, but she has either be, been unintentionally or intentionally left out of the story. Now, why? There's lots of questions to surround that. And again, people created organizations because when they felt left out of 
social movements. Um, Lifting as we climb was the official motto of the National Association of Colored Women's Club. There were, there were black women suffragists. I cannot say that enough. We largely see when you Google suffrage, when you Google suffrage parade, you will rarely see images of black suffragists. And that's because of how the movement was shaped through leadership, through the coercive philanthropy, like I said earlier. And that's something that we must recognize and tackle as we talk about these movements once again today. So the social movements that were founded in the mid to late 1800s with the changing cultural values by the time we reach, you know, prohibition in 1920, the Great Depression, World War II, that led to changing social movements, especially as we look at the legislation associated with them. We have the legislation tied to the social movements. So the National Park Service was established in 1916, which ties to our official constructs to manage and take care of those parks. We officially got rangers. We officially started to get people who knew how to manage the park systems. Every kid was required to finish elementary school and every single state, every single state had legislation for this by 1918. So education started to creep toward being coming more accessibility or more accessible by the 1900s. In 1954, we have Brown versus Board of Education and that is the legislation that led to the de- or made it illegal to have segregated schools. That does not mean that all schools were desegregated at that point. I live in Columbus, Ohio, and Columbus had segregated schools until 1978. 1978, let that sink in. And the only reason Columbus desegregated schools was because of a court order. So we have these legislative acts that help push these social movements forward, help them achieve the goals and the reasons why these grassroots movements started, but then also there's still been work to continue after these laws. Like I said previously about the 19th Amendment, not all people could vote, which led to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was an effort to prohibit um, voter suppression. Um, There were many, cities, counties, municipalities, states, what have you, that required tests to be able to vote would specifically keep people out of, um, physically keep people out of the polls. There was a wide variety of different types of voter suppression, even after the suffrage movement was successful in getting the 19th Amendment passed, so 1965. And again, the Voting Rights Act, successful in 1965, which theoretically was supposed to make it so that all people, regardless of gender or the color of their skin could vote, it did not actually ensure that because it was not until the 1970s that all indigenous people, the native people of America could vote because that was on a state by state basis. So that prohibited the indigenous people of our country until the 1970s. So really think about that. That is very, very recent past. That's just 50 years ago. And then we have the National Historic Preservation Act, which is a part of the National Park Service. The National Historic Preservation Act is the modern, the contemporary historic preservation movement. It gave us the opportunities to easily create local and national historic districts. It created constructs which made it so that any project that receives federal dollars, like a road construction project, has to also be surveyed to make sure nothing above or below ground is being harmed. So all of these grassroots movements, they've led to legislation, which theoretically hold up and empower and give legitimacy to the social movements. But as we sit here today and reflect on how some of these social movements were created, how they evolved, how they intentionally and unintentionally left out people, we need to start to reflect on how everything connects. So 
I look at Mount Rushmore today and I actually visited Mount Rushmore earlier this year for the first time. And Mount Rushmore was constructed in the 1927s to 1941. It is a huge sculpture. It is even bigger than I thought it would be based on all the photos that I've seen growing up. But Mount Rushmore desecrated six grandfathers. Six grandfathers was part of the Lakota tribes cultural heritage. So we start to just think about how a place like Sixth Grandfathers, which had natural beauty, which had important connections to the people who lived there, how we decided to build the monuments to certain individuals, which then left out other people. So I think we have to start to do better when we look at all of these social movements, like I've said again and again, we have to be okay with confronting the difficult aspects of these movements so that we can better understand how it's led to where we are today so that we can be better grassroots advocates. And for me, this includes redefining who's a preservationist. I want us to go back to believing that a preservationist is anybody who believes in the preservation of intangible and tangible aspects of the past for the betterment of communities today and the future. That's what I think a preservationist is. But you would be shocked by the number of people who act like preservationist holds the same level of clout as a doctor. No, you don't need to have a degree to become a preservationist. Anybody can be one. And our founding members of the preservation movement, like Anne Pamela Cunningham and Adina Dezavala, prove that. And people like Esther Gordy Edwards in Detroit, Michigan, she proves that. It's because of Esther that we still have Hitsville, USA standing strong in Detroit as a testament to the Motown history. Motown's history, it's vibrant. It was a whole entire cultural movement. It wasn't just music. It's something that's a really important part of music history. So Esther, as a preservationist, she understood the value of saving the recording studio. And I like to joke that my presentations are also just travel tips. I highly recommend whenever you're in Detroit, visit the Motown Museum. It is amazing. We also have preservationists like Marie Wilcox. Marie is the last person who's fully fluent in the dialect of the Tula Kawia. She has created a dictionary to preserve this language. Marie is a preservationist because she is doing an active part to preserve her tribe's language to ensure cultural enrichment and understanding for the future generations of both her community members and the broader people of the area. So this ties into reevaluating what we are saving and what stories we are telling. It's really important for us to recognize that preservation can be done in a wide variety of ways and that there are a wide variety of stories we can and should tell. And we can't get too caught up on the losses. Um, I apologize for leaving out this caption. This is Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth gave an infamous speech, Ain't I a Woman, which systematically deconstructed racism and sexism in the 1870s in Akron, Ohio. And to the left, you can see the historic marker on the building that destroyed the church. Um, or <laughs> maybe this building came after the church's destruction. But all we have there is a marker. So let's learn from our mistakes as community advocates and so that we can do a better job to preserve these stories. Because Sojourner, she deserves better. Her story deserves better. And we have people like Rachel Raymond, who designed the house on the right. Um, Rachel Raymond was a female architect in the early 1900s, mid 1900s. This wasn't common. There are, there are still very few licensed women architects in the country. So we need to preserve things like Rachel and the structure she's built. We also need to preserve spaces that were created 
for women, for people of color, for people, all types of people, so that we're preserving a large range of histories. This is Prentice Women's Hospital, which was unfortunately lost in 2014. Uh, this was a women's hospital specifically to train um, nurses and other female practitioners in medicine, and also to serve women um, who needed medical care. We need to preserve the oral histories and the stories of all types of people. Um, many of us growing up, I think we've gotten to experience lectures from Holocaust survivors, for instance. Um, the <coughs> I apologize. The Library of Congress during the early 1900s as part of the Works Progress Administration, they traveled the country creating, collecting oral histories from former enslaved individuals. They collected the stories from these freedmen and women as a way to docu document what it was like to be an enslaved individual. These oral histories are really important for moments of time. And again, I think we think about history sometimes like it's far and away, but for instance, this photo, while it shows in black and white, Chances are potentially it may have been in color. Um, you know, there's a car there. There was color photography at that time. This photo was relatively recently taken. So, you know, history's happening now. We need to be proactive to collect oral histories of current events or events that maybe our parents or grandparents experienced, because that is history. And when we preserve histories, it's the good, the difficult, the mundane. It's stories like Manzanar concentration camp. Um, during World War II, Japanese concentration camps were created after <coughs> the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Japanese Americans, many individuals who were American citizens, they were put in concentration camps. Now, why do I say concentration camps and not internment camps? That's because of part of rethinking preservation, it's rethinking the words and terminology that we use. Concentration camp is defined as a camp where people who are political prisoners are moved to, and they are sometimes forced to do labor and sometimes killed. Um, but this is a concentration camp, not an internment camp. An internment camp is a euphemism to try and make it seem like this place was less violent. Over 100,000 people were moved from their homes. They moved to these camps where many fell ill to due to the poor living conditions. The famous Great Depression photographer Dorothea Lange photographed these camps, and those images were suppressed by the U.S. government because they did not want people to see how poor the conditions were. And these people were forced to work on farms. Um, and these camps were all over the country, not just in California, like many people perceive because Manzanar are the most well-preserved ones there, but they're all over the country, even as far as Georgia. And when these individuals left the camps, they were given the equivalent of $360 in today's dollars and a bus ticket. Many of them lost their entire money. So this is a difficult history, but this is a part of American history people don't necessarily know. And this is a type of history we need to preserve and tell. So how do we start doing that? Um, we can start by telling stories of people like Polly Murray. Polly Murray was a civil rights activist and a lawyer who actually worked with Ruth Bader Ginsburg to create legislation and to write um, um, feedback on lawsuits that was published. And Polly's home, as you can see in the lower right, it had started to fall apart. Polly's legacy as a leader in the movement, as somebody who, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's considered very well known at this point, has attributed to developing her ideas, her legacy had started to be forgotten. Luckily, people in North Carolina recognized that this legacy couldn't be forgotten, and they partnered with the National Trust for Historic Preservation to do an active campaign to preserve the property. The property is now owned by Duke University, and there's a nonprofit, and it was supposed to be open to the public this year. I'm not sure if that's happening, but it's now a National Historic Landmark and Polly's legacy is being preserved in the future. Polly is a history that I never knew 
I doubt you knew it. So, you know, why haven't we learned about her as a civil rights leader? Why haven't we learned about people like the Mujeres Muralistas, the, who did Chicano murals? And murals can be a part of preservation as well. Um, these murals that were a part of the Chicano movement, you can see them in places like Chicago, Denver, California, all over the place. And they were part of the Chicano movement, which recognized that many people of Mexican descent were also of Native Americas as the larger sense of Americas stretching from Canada down to South America. Like they had um, ancestry that was being ignored. So these murals emerged as a way to tell the stories of what a Chicano individual or a, the Chicano movement or community means. So like these murals that are storytelling, that were grassroots, that were their own social movement, let's preserve those. And by preserving the wider range of stories, we start to cultivate relevance because we want to connect the dots. I have thoroughly been enjoying learning more and more about the suffrage movement this year. I am continually stunned by the efforts made by these women and some men to get people the equal right to vote. So I've been facilitating banner workshops, um, virtual and in-person pre-pandemic, where people got to create banners after learning about the imagery and the verbiage used in the suffrage movement and create banners of their own. And I just love how people just take inspiration to create and then use it to create their own grassroots movement or use it to express themselves and be advocates for themselves. I think that's what the original leaders of all of these social movements would want. They would want people to be able to have a voice to be advocates for themselves and to use that to educate others. And the one in the middle always makes me laugh. Woman making man say, whoa, since forever. That's a pretty good um, way to summarize the suffrage movement. It is whoa. And we can creatively think about ways to be okay, just okay. We don't have to feel good about the sites we lost, but we can be okay with it and we can start the healing process for all. In Rochester, New York, Anna and Frederick Douglass's home at some point in time turned into a parking lot. A wonderful librarian there, Hinda Mandel, has been creating pop-up collaborative textile art installations to showcase the history and I was happy to participate in this one where anybody from all over the country could submit an eight by eight square. So I submitted that little embroidery right in the front that says tell the full history. So Hinda's work to just raise awareness for the fact that Frederick Douglass, a very influential man in civil rights and abolitionist history, his home has been lost and that led to that sculpture being created. And it's actually leading to a larger investment in the community to build, um, build out that sculpture in ways that tell the story better. So sometimes just think creatively, think about impermanence to tell the stories. It doesn't have to be formal. And we need to expand who's telling the history as well. Cheney McKnight is a, she runs Not Your Mama's History. Cheney McKnight is a woman who travels the country training people how to be first person interpreters. Um, so what's a first person interpreter? That's the type of people that we see dressed up in traditional period garb who reenact the past as an actor. Um, Colonial Williamsburg, Battleburg, um, Battleburg, um, um, battle reenactments. Um, those are first person reenactors. And I know that for me growing up, I don't, I cannot, I can think of very few, if any, people of color who were reenactors. So Cheney's made it her mission to ensure that all types of people can be reenactors. So let's empower people to dress up and tell the story. And I know that kind of makes it seem a little more trivial, but there's a lot of power to being able to see people of the past. Oop, sorry, 
oh, I got so excited. I saw the Q and A and then I clicked. Um, okay, so we can also think about again how to activate these places in fun and different ways. So these fun and different ways can be helping people under connect to the built environment, the past, the history, in ways you may not have expected. Um, the So Modern Workshop in Phoenix, Arizona, I had so much fun during this project. This project was done in early last year. I partnered with Modern Phoenix, which is a nonprofit that works to preserve mid-century architecture, a local arts group, and then the developer who bought this 1960s mall in Phoenix, Arizona. The first mall in Phoenix, Arizona. It's really, it's a neat design, if I'm being honest. So the developer has a number of empty storefronts, and he wasn't sure what to do with it. So as a way to raise awareness for women's history and their designs through textiles, I did the Sew Modern workshop. There was a design competition where over 600 people submitted entries that reflected how they interpreted mid-century modern and the desert. Um, you can see the winning design in the right photo. And then to test out one of the vacant storefronts <coughs> to see if it could plausibly be converted into a maker space, we had a sewing workshop. So again, we're preserving a traditional women's trade. Sewing, that's a ton of fun. Um, and a lot of people don't know how to sew anymore. And so we've got this multi-tier. We're raising people awareness for a specific type of history. We're empowering people to understand the history of women. We're teaching people a traditional trade. And then we're activating a vacant space. That's so exciting. We're helping see whether or not this space can be developed. So before we dive into the workshop, we can go ahead and answer some questions. Um, so the question is, a uh, current topic of debate is Confederate statues of generals and others. They are history, but they are generally erected in the Jim Crow era for racist reasons. We have a Confederate statue soldiers um, in a camp cemetery, no problem for me, but many Southern cities and even Washington DC have such statues in prominent places such as Richmond, Virginia has Losers Lane, a prominent waste street with a number of such statues. Um, what do you think should be done with such history? Um, I think, and feel free to throw your questions into the Q&A if you have any right now. Um, we're gonna move on to the workshop, which will be a bit different next. <coughs> so if you have questions about social movements and what we can and should preserve, bring it on now. All right, so for me, Monuments are very different than places where history occurred. A monument to an individual, yes, it tells a story, but that's not where the history occurred. Should we preserve Civil War battlefields? Yes. Should we preserve plantations? Yes. Should we preserve, like I said, concentration camps? Yes. Should we preserve places where difficult history happened? 110% yes. Should we preserve the statues to individuals who perpetuated hate? No, I, I don't think that these statues contribute to storytelling, especially with how these statues currently exist. Uh, largely, these statues have no type of context next to them. There's no type of storytelling associated with them. They're just a flat out a statue to an individual who was, most of them were white supremacists, if we're being fully honest. They did not believe that people of color should have equal rights. They believed that the white race was superior. And we cannot deny that the Civil War was because of the slave industry. Um, so I think these should be displaced. Um, if you have one at, for example, at a cemetery, I highly recommend you create signage near it to help people understand the stories of the past. Um, many museums don't want these statues, but I know there are a lot of brainstorms about how these statues 
could be preserved for contextualization and storytelling. Um, I honestly think the historic preservation movement and the public history movement dropped the ball on this because as we'll see in the workshop, I believe in being a proactive preservationist. This reactive stuff doesn't cut the bill. People are upset right now about Mount Rushmore. I'm glad they're upset that Mount Rushmore destroyed six grandfathers, but these same people aren't being advocates against other construction projects that are happening right now that are destroying cultural resources and environmental areas. So I know that's kind of a bolder statement, but we have to tell these stories in new and different ways. Okay, um, are there any other questions? All right, well, feel free to drop a question in the Q&A if you have any as we go. Um, so for this workshop, I would like you to consider using the chat feature. If you would like, um, you can use the chat feature and you can express, Oh, I got another comment. Thanks. Um, can it also depend statues on who built them and when the statues were built? Um, so I, I will fully admit I am not a Civil War history expert. I will admit that I am not a Reconstructionist expert. I specialize in 20th century history. Um, so almost immediately after the Civil War, um, revisionist storytelling started to happen. And there's actually been studies by the Southern um, Poverty Law Center, if I'm remembering um, that name correct, that has shown that most people, or not most people, most students today graduate high schooling not understanding that the Civil War was directly tied to slaveholding. And I know that the Civil War, there are a lot of elements tied to it, but those elements that can also be largely attributed to the Civil War were tied to economy. And the economy was directly tied to having enslaved and unpaid labor. So they were treating individuals like machinery. And when they were going to lose their machinery, they were going to lose their entire economy. So that is why the Civil War happened. So almost immediately after the Civil War, there started to be revisionist stories that tried to make it not be about race, that tried to make it about preserving <coughs> people's livelihoods that tried to take away the way individuals were completely dehumanized. So even the older statues that were done immediately after the Civil War have perpetuated the false impression of what the Civil War was and what it did. So it's really difficult and I highly recommend that you look up Monuments Lab as a resource. Um, Monuments Lab is a really wonderful group that does a lot of research and community engagement around monuments. Um, but, but again, my stance, when you boil it down, it's the monuments aren't the history. There are places that tell the history those places should be preserved, whether it's good, bad, mundane, or otherwise. Um, so how do we advocate for preserving the past? Ooh, we want to preserve the good history. We want to preserve accomplishments like falling water, which is arguably one of the most iconic structures in America. We want to preserve the good histories, like the great accomplishments of people. We want to tell the stories where gold was first discovered. We want to tell the stories like Gettysburg Battle being won. We want to tell all types of good celebratory stories, whether it's tied to specific individuals, structural achievements, cultural achievements, or otherwise. We also want to tell the difficult stories. Um, like we've really delved into difficult stories. It's, it's easily the hardest thing to want to tell the stories of, but a lot of people are doing great work to interpret this history and to find ways to tell those stories. Um, <coughs> but for the purposes of today, 
We want to tell even the mundane stories, the everyday stories of everyday people, because those are the stories that often get lost. This could be a pasty in the Upper Peninsula, which is reflective of the immigrants who worked in the iron mills up there. Um, so we want to preserve those Sunday night dinners at your family's house. We wanna preserve the stories of you sitting on the floor watching TV with your family. Everyday history has cultural value because it's part of the sense of place. It's part to the larger context of our communities and the decisions that are made. Now those everyday moments, those can be really hard to advocate for because those everyday moments, those moments can be fading already. And I hope that as we work through these steps, I hope, I encourage you, I have the Zoom webinar chat pulled up. I want to hear from you all, like your ideas, your thoughts on this comments, and then I'll break out of the screen when we're done with those and we can have a bigger conversation because I know that I'm delving into some difficult things. So um, the everyday special moments, those can be hard to advocate for. And I've heard from at least a few people that there's a lot of concern around the porches and lakeside. People are enclosing the per porches to have more interior space. Um, lakeside's losing that really important part of the culture, the ability to just say hi to a passing stranger, the porch, which historically has been a wonderful way to connect indoors and outdoors, you know, Lakeside really is tied to porches. It's a very large architectural feature that you see on houses of all sizes, but it's also directly tied to the culture. Because when we think about when Lakeside was originally established, there weren't TVs, you know, at best there might have been a radio, you know, after it had been established for a, few, a number of years. <coughs> but those porches really are part of the social life, the cultural life. Coming to Lakeside, you don't go to Lakeside to sit inside. You go to Lakeside to make new friends, to explore the area, to spend time on the lake absorbing natural beauty, to try and perfect your shuffle board. But we want to preserve these porches. So to raise to the three basic fundamentals of advocacy are community awareness. You have to raise awareness that there is an issue at all because many people might not be aware. And in a place like Lakeside, it, that's extra difficult. Many of the people who come to Lakeside are people who are renting a vacation home for a week. Um, there are some people who are seasonal rest residents. There are some people who stay for more than just the summer. Um, we also have the businesses there. So raising awareness for your community in your case means you have a broader audience of people that you need to connect to and engage with. And one of the fun ways you can do this is by having a clever campaign. The Young Urban Preservationist in Rochester, New York, have a campaign called Park Ave is Porches. And this was a way to raise awareness for a specific historic dis district's porches um, as just like a fun way to represent the cultural community. Um, I'm sure you can ask my friend Caitlin if you can steal the catchphrase. I'm sure she wouldn't mind, um, but you know, coming up with a clever campaign, it's really integral to help people want to be a part of a grassroots movement. And when we look at our social movements from the 1800s, we can find a variety of examples of this. We can find examples in the suffrage movement having four official colors in the United States, which were yellow, white, purple, and green, which each of, with each of the colors meaning something different. And they had specific and approved language, which was used for all of their marketing campaigns. We can talk about it with the National Park Service. We have the iconic Works Progress Administration posters, um, which have now turned into postcards, puzzles, and otherwise. Those are iconic, um, but those visuals 
really got people to want to visit those sites and be a part of what the parks stand for. For the Chautauquas, I've loved seeing some of the older promotional flyers utilized to lure people in to get in. Like visuals and cleverness really plays in. It's about snappy catchphrases. It's about luring people in with essentially a good marketing campaign to get them to want to be a part of your movement. We also have <coughs> to understand our governing bodies for historic preservation in this sense. Um, for Lakeside, we have a local architecture review board who reviews the modifications to structures. Um, the National Register of Historic Places does not protect structures. Um, the National Register of Historic Places only protects a building if there's federal dollars involved. So that's really important to understand and to recognize. So local architecture review is great because it actually has teeth. So the step one to creating our advocacy campaign is we want to identify our area of concern. And our area of concern for me today would be Lakeside's porches. Um, you can consider all other different parts of areas of concern. Is it a specific building that you have seen being underutilized or not utilized? Is it a building that's potentially gonna be torn down? Is it a building that, I don't know, you see somebody proposing something crazy for at an optic, I mean, architectural review board meeting. It could be all types of things. So let's identify our area of concern initially. And in our case, it's the porches, or in my case, I'm gonna say the porches. I want Lakeside to retain its porches. I don't want people to turn them into interior spaces because porches are the best for a variety of reasons. So let's analyze our toolkit. So we know we have local architecture review. We know we have national historic designation. What else do we have? Or what else could we potentially have? What's in your toolkit and what's missing from your toolkit? I would say something that's potentially missing from the Lakeside Toolkit is easements. Property easements are the only way out of all of the preservation tools to preserve a property and to protect it from demolition. An easement is given to a property, um, a uh, historic easement specifically is given to a property that is has historic designation and an easement is given to an organization like an Ohio, Heritage Ohio holds and manages them. And the easement would prevent potential exterior changes like a porch being lost, demolition, potentially an egregious and oversized addition. Easements are the only way to fully protect a building. And I think that might be missing from the Lakeside Toolkit. Um, so easements do have some property benefit or <coughs> financial benefit for the property holder or owner. And it would be for whatever your property loses in development rights, you get as a tax benefit. I'm not an accountant. Please don't ask me any questions about the full financial logistics of that. But in the instance of my slide, let's look at this tiny little cottage. This tiny little cottage, I bet the land it's on is almost worth more than the house itself. This is charming as heck. It's representative of older lakeside. It's a building that shouldn't be lost. So if this property owner put an easement on it, then for whatever they lost in development, right? So let's say these numbers are not real numbers. Please do not hold them to them. Let's say this property is worth $200,000. Okay, great. But if I tore this down and replaced it with a property that would be worth $400,000, then, you know, whatever I lost in my development rights, that $200,000 um, investment property gap, then I would get that as a tax cut. So that's just something to consider. So our toolkits, we have local districts, we have national districts, we have easements. What else do we have? Do we have a business community? Oh wait, we have a great archives to utilize. We have a lot of things in our toolkit here where we can research the property, where we can understand 
all aspects of the history of the building itself, the buildings itself, the larger community, so that we can be strong and informed advocates. So now that we've kind of done our research, we know what tools exist and don't exist. We know all about the permit department and city government and all the bureaucracy hoops we'd have to jump through. Let's analyze our target audience. So again, for Lakeside, identifying a target audience is incredibly difficult because we have people who are there for what is a seemingly small blip of time to people who have invested their time, money, and energy to be a larger component of the group. I will say something that I've seen be a really big negative to a number of advocacy campaigns and preservation, I've seen a lot of people leaving out the renters. And I understand your situation, there are some very short-term renters, but that doesn't mean that those renters aren't invested. You can find out potentially through the um, rental companies in Lakeside, <coughs> who are the families that come back every year. I know a family that has been coming back to Lakeside for over 30 years. The reason why they didn't buy the property is because the grandma, when she wanted to buy a property way back when, her husband was like, oh, that won't be worth anything in the long run. So instead, they just decided to rent every year. And it's now still a tradition more than 30 years later. So there's a lot of people who, even if they're just renters, have those really huge connections to the community. And that's worth considering. We have our businesses in this instance who they don't want to lose the lakeside charm, whether it's the porches or otherwise, because the lakeside charm is what really, if we sit and think about it, helps drive people to there. Lakeside would not be the same if it was just all new construction from 2020. That would not have the magic feeling. That would be anywhere town USA on the lake. So we want to connect to our businesses. We want to connect to short-term people who engage with Lakeside. We want to engage with the long-term people. We want to engage with the people who work for the businesses, not just the business owners. We want to engage with all types of people. And through that, you'll start to develop some stakeholders who potentially might be able to represent specific audiences or otherwise, but cool. So, now that we know who we wanna engage with, we know our tools, we start to create our advocacy language. Cause once again, like por por um, Park Ave is porches, we wanna create our specific advocacy language because we want it to be catchy. We want it to inspire more people to be a part of it. We want people to be able to <coughs> just want to learn more and there's a whole variety of different strategies, but you know, create our advocacy campaign. And um, I appreciate our um, respondent who says that um, you can change your porches too. So I would say like, even as we advocate for porches, we can advocate for how people can tastefully modify the porches to still retain the historic character of the area. Cause not all modifications are created equally is always important to remember. So let's create our advocacy language to lure all types of people in, to inspire and get people excited to do more, want to be more, it's great. Um, for women's suffrage, it was simply votes for women. That's to the point, that's very direct. Think through our advocacy language. And then step five is get the word out. So how do we wanna get the word out? Is it maybe we do porch signs? Is it maybe we do shirts? I know there's wonderful lakeside branding up there. Um, what? How do we get the word out? Is it we have something on everybody's admittance ticket that they get when they pay for their car to come through? Something about, hey, we're raising awareness for this. Is it the social media? How do we wanna get the word out? There's so many different ways to do it. So, <coughs> The hardest part of all of this though, is the keeping the momentum going. Um, I thought this photo was funny with the little abandoned tricycle as a great example of keeping the momentum going. Whoever that little kid was just couldn't keep going. He was too, or she was too tired. So 
figuring out the momentum is really an integral part of this. I know that I've been a part of grassroots initiatives where me, Sarah, the Energizer Bunny, when I've stepped away, it hasn't been able to sustain. So it's really important as you're organizing this grassroots momentum to make sure that you have a multi-headed approach. You have many people helping lead it. Maybe it's just five people, maybe it's three people, but make sure you have enough people who represent different aspects of the community to be able to engage in different perspectives and dialogues to have the momentum going. And that also helps beat burnout by including and having all types of people. So I'm going to stop sharing now so that we can switch to more of a conversation. I think I've switched. So, um, yeah, so what are our questions, concerns? What would you all like to talk about now? I see there's um, concerns about building demolition. It's a big issue. Sometimes building condition is one of the reasons given for demolition, but buildings can be restored. But some folks don't like what they have and cost is not an issue for them. So this is a great question and, or a statement. A lot of people don't understand the potential in restoration. So a few different strategies that I would look at if I was trying to advocate to minimize demolition in a historic district, I would A, start by reevaluating what your codes are in your community. Um, again, <clears throat> what type of teeth do your local designations have? Are your local designations being ignored by the city officials who hand out the permits? Is that one of the issues? Um, are your commissioners not as well trained? If you serve on the Lakeside Architectural Review Board, I really highly encourage you to consider signing up for the National Alliance of Preservation Commission's virtual conference, which is in a week. I think it's next week. Um, it's $100, so I know that is a bit of an investment, but that's a really wonderful training opportunity for you all to learn new strategies um, for what you can do as a commissioner. And I really recommend this educational opportunity. Um, I attended, it's an every other year conference, first of all, so every two years. And it's really nice because it's not just for preservation professionals. There are a ton of people who just volunteer in their communities who sign up. So the information is really inclusive and educational for all. So let's see. So we want to review our ordinances. Um, maybe we need to be advocates to update the ordinances. Um, do we want to raise awareness or improve our local commission guidelines? And that might require educating and improving what our commissioners know. And I know it's really tough when you volunteer your time and your energy to be on one of these review boards to take that extra step, but I highly recommend it because you clearly are passionate about the place by signing up. So let's make sure that you have the verbiage and the confidence to speak back to the people who don't necessarily understand the value of Lakeside. Um, demolition again, I would highly recommend looking further into easements and I will respond now in the chat with who you should contact. Um, so that you can reach out to Frank Quinn at Heritage Ohio. And Frank manages the easements for Heritage Ohio and he can give you a rundown on what the heck that means um, further than what I did as a 101. But like I said, easements are the only real protection against demolition so that when you, Dakota, you sell your property that the next person is not allowed at all legally to tear down the building. It is the ultimate teeth more so than whatever your local bureaucracy is. Okay, so our next step with demolition is, why are people demolishing? Is it because they don't like the historic 
property? Is it because the building was in quote unquote bad condition? Um, start to look for <coughs> local and nearby professionals who can assist to prove that a building isn't quote unquote too far gone. Now, maybe it's a structural engineer or otherwise, but this should be part of your assessment as an architecture review board, um, actually requiring the applicants to provide additional information to prove that the building is quote unquote too far gone. I am a firm believer that almost no building is too far gone unless it's falling in on itself. So we can look to Cincinnati and find some really rough buildings that have transformed with new life as a great example for that. But um, the point is you need to start to require enough documentation. Um, I previously worked for the German Village Society in Columbus. And when I worked for German Village, for example, um, windows. Windows are a really valuable way to retain historic visuals of the community. And of course, windows in Columbus take a lot less of a weather beating than the windows up in Lakeside. So the windows here, the residents or the applicants had to prove that a window was over 50% damaged before it could be replaced with a new thing. All right. So that's just some, you know, like the more bureaucratic stuff, but let's think about how we can do some community engagement to inspire people to not want to tear down the old house. Um, do you, would you all maybe consider doing an open house periodically of a house that has a beautiful interior rest restoration that's modernized it to help inspire people? Or maybe it's not a physical tour where people go and get to explore the inside of somebody's house. Maybe it's a virtual tour. Um, think through the ways to help people see how they can modify a historic property and turn it into a vibrant contemporary space, which can mean a whole gamut of things. I'm not necessarily trying to get full-blown modernism here, um, but you know, a thing that honors the past while still updates it for contemporary living needs. Um, so one of the reasons why I'm a huge, huge, huge advocate of finding ways to show interior spaces, it's because people have a terrible imagination. I know that's really rough of me to say, but a lot of people just cannot, for the life of them, visualize how a building could be fixed up if it's down in the dumps. Cannot visualize how an interior space could transform into something more contemporary. Uh, people just don't necessarily have that kind of brain. Um, which is why architects are is such a great profession for people to be in. Um, so find ways to help people see how lakeside properties have been able to evolve with history. And maybe you can use that as help, helpful pointers as a way to deter demolition. Um, if you're looking for some more bureaucratic aspects, um, look up I think it's Chicago. Chicago has a stop order where if any building that's older than 1940, that the city instantly stops and does a full blown review of the building before it gets torn down. I'd also encourage looking at your larger city strategic plan. Lots of cities have them. Um, some cities include sustainability as a part of them. So if your city has any type of sustainability statement on it, then you can integrate why buildings shouldn't be demolished into a part of sustainability because tearing down a building is adding things into a landfill. Um, so I also think that activating your business owners is a really vital aspect of this because your business owners have an economic investment in your community. When people go to Lakeside, they go to, what is it, Sloopy's for some pizza. You know, that pizza institution potentially would not be able to withstand a full cultural loss of all the new builds. Because again, if 
everything gets replaced, then you have nothing and it loses its charm. The people who want to tear down these buildings are struggling to connect the dots as to why they're investing in this area. It's not because they want to be next to the lake. No, there's plenty of cheap lakeside properties you can get in Ohio. You, they are investing because they want the lakeside community. So it's your job as local community advocates to find ways to be educators, like your original Chautauqua movement leaders. Be educators. It's great that you all have these lectures. It's great that you have the archives. But how do you better utilize all the research and all the tools that you have in new ways and strategies? That, um, you know, your historic designation research, it's great. It's awesome. You know, how do you turn that into ways to further bring things to life? I know there's some historic markers in Lakeside. Is it having more markers that tell the bigger story of Lakeside? Um, and I'll give a, in the chat, a company name that does them very affordably. They're based down in Cincinnati where you can get affordable um, markers and you can email me um, to find out more information about them and to see some examples of them. But, you know, maybe you all need to find new ways to tell the stories, um, unexpected ways to tell the stories, just to reinforce to people why there is a value there. Um, so I know I'm just kind of rambling at this point, but um, so we'll go back to our steps. So, <coughs> When we're also wanting to evaluate demolition, let's think through why people are tearing things down because they theoretically want new amenities. So we're gonna educate them on why they don't need a tear down to have new amenities. We're also really gonna have to analyze the real estate value of Lakeside to understand the economic aspect of this. Um, so I say this because A, the easement opportunity, but then B, we want to analyze how well the historic properties over time have retained their value in comparison to the contemporary properties. And if your historic district is anything like other historic districts where there is a trend where the historic properties in, a his, in an older area, they retain and gain value at a greater exponential rate than the contemporary properties within the same district. So how do you do that research? Um, you can reach out to your local assessor or auditor and you can collect sale data from them. Um, that's <laughs> on their website, but if it's not at their website, you may have to go to the office and actually use pencil and paper, which is shocking for 2020. Um, but this is really, really, really great because one thing I know about people who move into a historic district with a lot of money who wants to want to make changes, they don't want to shoot themselves in the foot for the investment that that property gives them. So I highly recommend you adding that as a part of your toolkit. Understand the economic aspects of property ownership and long-term investment impact from property ownership comparing contemporary to historic properties. You may find surprising, exciting things, but I highly, highly, highly recommend that. When I did that project for German Village, I was able to show that the historic properties grew at an exponential rate compared to the contemporary structures or even the structures that had lost a lot of its, his, their historic integrity. Uh, Cause there are some real squirrely additions that were allowed in the 1980s for, for whatever reason or like full blown facade changes, really, really odd stuff. The 1980s architects must've uh, been partying or something. So, I was able to convince all the local realtors because realtors love to show people what type of an investment a property could be to hand out brochures that had a summary of this economic study 
So the brochure had a page that said the history of the neighborhood. It had a page about what type of contemporary activities are in the neighborhood. So in your instance, you all can say lit lecture series. You can say that <coughs> people can do putt-putt, all the activities on the lake, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a page on in the brochure that talked about how smart it is to invest in an old building and how investing in older buildings and keeping older buildings is a smarter use of your money. And on the back side of the brochure, it had a whole bunch of information about the architecture review process. But I just really encourage in your case for your concerns on demolition or loss of major character elements to look at other similar communities and see what type of local design review they have to try and maybe update yours. Um, I know it's really tough to update your local design review, but there's just a ton of benefits to doing that overhaul. And if you reach out to the State Historic Preservation Office, they actually give grants to help with it. So you may be able to get a grant to bring in a consultant who can do a lot of this research for you so that your ordinance that get created your architecture design review has more teeth so that you all can be firmer in fighting the demolition. And when I say similar communities, um, you know, yes, I mean, looking at what other Chautauqua communities have done, but then also looking for similar sized communities that are on water. Um, like I can think of a couple in California, potentially. <clears throat> I can think of some up on Lake Michigan. There are a lot of other similar sized communities. Um, I wouldn't say that they're as beautiful as um, lakeside or necessarily as large. So I know you all have a bigger task because of the size of your district, but look into those grants from the State Historic Preservation Office. They offer grants that can help you update and improve your design review because you all need more teeth and you all need to be utilizing some of the ideas that I gave you to find fun ways to engage with all types of audience members, whether it's passive engagement with more signage, um, telling stories through the community. I know you all do a pretty good job of that already, but like what are the hidden histories that you haven't told yet? Maybe it's creating contemporary art and and by contemporary, temporary art, you know, maybe that's a fun way to do a community engagement opportunity that engages all of the audiences. Like everybody's encouraged to contribute to fill a part of Lakeside. Uh, maybe you all need to consider doing some stakeholder research. There's a wide variety of ways to consider developing this advocacy campaign. And I know you all have been doing a lot of work Okay, a question. In Lakeside, do realtors and contractors play a role different from that in other communities? Um, I, I am not an expert on Lakeside real estate by any means, but Lakeside is different from other communities in the sense that, um, and please somebody who is more familiar with Lakeside, feel free to comment and say if I'm wrong, but um, you don't have full blown ownership of the property. It's a long term easement, not easement, um, a long term lease, right, for the property, where it's like a lease in perpetuity, but the Chautauqua community technically owns it or something along those lines. Um, the contractors shouldn't play any different role in Lakeside than other communities. Um, contractors are contractors. Um, there's a lot of difficulties with contractor education. Um, blind Eye Restoration is a contractor based in Columbus, Ohio, who actually does education programming for contractors who aren't as familiar with historic buildings so that they know the ways to repair it because a lot of contractors, and I'm, I'm saying this as somebody who's done a lot of work with contractors, a lot of them just like see the issue and they're like, okay, I know how to fix this. And 
I've worked 99% of the time on contemporary buildings. I just want to fix it like this is a contemporary building. So you really do need to be a bit more mindful of the contractors that you hire so that you know, like when you're calling them, you know, ask them questions. Have you worked on older buildings? Um, when you're calling them, um, <coughs> say that you want somebody with experience with older buildings. If you're looking for people who have experience with older buildings, there are a few different resources that you can look to. Um, Heritage Ohio, again, the statewide nonprofit for preservation in Ohio, they, uh, um, they have a database for contractors for around the state who have experience working with historic buildings. Um, so that's one option, but you can also research, reach out to certain contracts, like for example, I said Blind Eye Restoration because they're in Columbus, um, and they can write the specifications for a project in a historic building, and then a contractor who works mostly on contemporary, once they have the specifications, they're like, okay, I know how to do this, and they're still getting paid. They just need a bit more extra knowledge to be able to successfully do that. And I also highly encourage um, finding ways to uplift the contractors who are doing a good job with older structures. This could be from an award. This could be creating your own lakeside specific contractor database. It could be any number of things and i know it does put you but you're not necessarily recommending them you're just saying they have the resume that lets them under that shows that they know how to work with older structures and that's really invaluable in my experience working with older buildings finding contractors who are either familiar with how to work with an older structure or are willing to listen. Because some contractors will just try and give you the hard sell to get you to do things their way, which is the way they know how, aka the easy way. So they just make the money. And I even experienced that with my own home restoration. I have a 1920s bungalow and I in the living room, one of the previous owners uh, drywalled over three windows, including a bay window. Who wants to get rid of natural light? Out of control. Um, but like when I was vetting window people to when I was reopening these windows, a, a number of them just tried to hard sell me, not listen to what I wanted as a customer. So sometimes it's so it's a mix of educating the contractors, but then also educating homeowners because I would say I'm a person who's worked in old buildings for over a decade. I know, I know fairly well how I should be communicating to contractors and it's still been difficult for me being able to feel confident and understand that what the contractor is telling me might not necessarily be fully transparent, if that makes sense. So we have three minutes left. So I know we tackled some difficult topics today and I just wanted to kind of introduce you to the idea that our social movements of the 1800s were invaluable. They helped make sure that education was accessible to a larger range of people. It preserved our natural landscapes, it preserved aspects of our built environment and the history associated with older buildings but these movements left out individuals intentionally and unintentionally so it's really important for why when we think about why somebody may not be a part of the historic preservation movement or why people may go to X place versus a national park or to lakeside or whatever. It's tied to the longer standing impacts of not feeling included. So it's our job as community advocates. And if you're listening, I consider you a community advocate. It's our job as community advocates and preservationists to 
recognize, research, and learn that full story so that we can do a better job at helping do the work to make sure everybody can feel included so that we can have them be a part of our community movement and a bigger part of that team. So I really hope that you'll consider that. And if you want to learn more about Lakeside's history, you can visit their archives. Um, I've only gotten to do a quick pop in there, but I know there's a lot of rich resources. There's also a historian currently working to discover the um, history of Chautauquas in Boulder, Colorado as a part of their Chautauqua, um, specifically tied to um, disengagement, I think is the, would be the right word, um, for excluding the Black community as a part of that Chautauqua movement. So there are some people starting to do that research. Um, I'm doing some work around it for the historic preservation movement to just tell the stories of more types of people who are doing um, preservation work earlier on from indigenous histories and cultures um, to the 1950s and 60s. Um, so a lot of us are out there doing the work. And if you're really interested in how the suffrage movement left out people, but then also how it was funded, really fascinating stuff. And it dives into the history of women's colleges. Um, I highly recommend reading Funding Feminism. It's um, the best book that I've found on the topic. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. It's very, very interesting and very informational. So thank you again for speaking with us today. Thank you. So we're sending our love for Lake from Lakeside and we'll see everybody later. Hope everyone has a great day. <laughs>